Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week for the second t time I've interviewed him is Eli Jackson Bear. Welcome, Eli. Thank you, Rick. Good to see you again. Yeah. I listened uh, just this past week to our original interview, and I was kind of amazed at how much we covered in a one-hour period. So I recommend that anyone listening to this one also go back and listen to that one, and hopefully we'll be able to cover some fresh ground in this one, although there's really nothing new to talk about, is there? <laughs> Same <Yeah>. old thing. <laughs> um, Eli has just uh, come out with a 10th, 10 year anniversary edition of a book he wrote called Sudden Awakening and I've read the book cover to cover and also skimmed it a second time. Um, it was a very enjoyable book to read. Um, last week I interviewed uh, C.Y. Ramana, you know, your brother Papa G. disciple. Uh, Yukio Ramana, or a uh, Japanese fellow. I don't know if you know. Oh, Yukio. Yeah. Yukio. I think you used to work with him. And um, yeah, and one thing I he... The, I, I told him to use the name Yukio. Oh, did you? Okay. And you and he actually worked together. But the reason I bring that up, I mean years ago, the reason I bring that up is that uh, he quotes at one point, he quotes Papaji as, as referring to awakening in a sense as just the beginning and that there's a sort of a wealth of unfoldment that, that can take place after that. So I thought I might start with that question since this is the 10th anniversary of, of this book. Um, you know, looking back on the previous 10 years, do you feel like there's been a, a deepening or a maturation or a, a refinement or something of, of the awakening which inspired this book? Well, you know, I just uh, returned from a trip back to Lucknow to my teacher's home mm -hmm. after 20 years, it's been mm -hmm. 20 years since I've been in India. And people say they notice a deepening, mm -hmm. they notice a change. But uh, as for myself, I can't say that I can say that life continues unfolding. That the waking up is the beginning of life. Mm. It's not the end. It's the end of suffering. It's the beginning of life. Right. And everything unfolds from that. But mm -hmm. there's a continual deepening. But I can't say that the the realization hasn't deepened in any particular sense. But um, I guess my I don't know. The incarnation has changed in some way. Would it be fair to say that? the realization doesn't change. There's a, a sort of a, a non-changing quality to it, yes. so, to, so to speak. But the um, reflection of it or the embodiment of it or could, That's right. could d deepen or refine or enrich. It definitely does. Yeah. And there are definitely tests along the way. And in that test, testing that happens, it's, it's like you shed. And like my experience, it's, like it's a shedding mm -hmm. of... Uh, Icebergs that I, you're not even aware that are there. Mm. Everything falls away in its own particular way, and not being aware of it before it falls away, the realization is the same. But after it falls away, there's a ah, a refreshing, a deepening. Of, I don't know what you'd call it. But, uh, <laughs> sort of a positive con connotation to Joni Mitchell's phrase: "You don't know what you got till it's gone." <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, the best sense. Yeah, yeah. There was a uh, a couple of chapters, short chapters in your book, which really directly address something that I'm chewing on these days. I thought I might also kind of start with a discussion of that. Um, on page 28, you say, the universe is the expression of the I thought, the reverberation of I. And the, on the next, uh, then there's this chapter, uh, the one cosmic being. And, and then... Uh, they, all, they all sort of go together. So the, uh, a couple pages after that, you say, the universe is an intelligent design that gives rise to organisms capable of intelligently investigating the paradoxical experience of form, transcending form. The cosmic being is waking up out of its starry slumber of unconscious dreaming. Oh. And I thought that was beautiful. And, oh, thank uh, you. Yeah. Um, any comments on that? I'm glad to hear it. I had no idea I'd, wrote, I'd written something like that. It's good. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Well, you well, know, I mean, one of the impressions I got in reading your book was that, you know, this, this book obviously has to have been written by someone who is living the experience. I don't think that there was a depth of, of uh, understanding that came through that could not be merely intellectual. That's good. Because, you know, my teacher said that uh, even parrots can be taught to speak the words of satsang. Mm -hmm. 
But the paradox is, is that if you're ripe and you're ready, then if you even hear it from a parrot, that can be enough to wake you up. Yeah. <laughs> And so, you know, we have Hui Nung, who is delivering a load of wood, an itinerant woodcutter. Here is some monks who are not awake, but are chanting the Diamond Sutra. And just in hearing it, he wakes up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the message can be conveyed in so many different forms. But if, uh, if you're ripe for it, if you're ready for it, then the uh, explosion of realization is calling you all the time in different forms and different ways. Yeah. I want to talk a lot about ripening in this conversation and, you know, how does one become more ripe and so on. Um, but before we go on to that, um, here's another thing related to the thing I just said. Maybe we can delve into it. Uh, I have this feeling that oneness needs duality in order to know itself, or, or to put it a different way, oneness creates duality in the process of knowing itself. And you seem to address that on page 35. You say, the light of consciousness is ever-present. Its apparent veiling reflects its own power to create an illusion of a universe so that it can meet itself, see itself, and love itself. Yes, well, that's the experience. Whether, you know, whether there's intention behind it or not, who can say? But, you know, it's like in the... We know there was a big bang. We know there was certainly there was a nothing, and then there's a something. And that something is this re is consciousness that is now exploded into all forms, and from the lowliest to the most elevated. And so then, as it comes to realize itself, it's seeing through its own veils. It's seeing through its own creation. So it's a mystery of love making, really. It's mm -hmm. consciousness loving itself in all forms. The reason I find that fascinating is that usually people, when they begin to think about enlightenment, get interested in it, and so on, they, they approach it from the perspective of the personal. They think, I am going to get enlightened. Oh boy, it's going to be great. You know? <laughs> but uh, this flips it around and, and kind of presents it from the perspective of the universal. You know, we are that waking yes. up to itself through the instrumentality of a form that that has created uh, yes. in order to wake it. And awaken to itself, really, and, yes. to, and to have that, to, to sort of live it as a living reality. That's it. That's, that's right. And so then, you know, it's like if we realize that we're a finger, and the finger is not separate from the hand, mm -hmm. and yet it is different from the hand, it has a different function. You can cut off the finger and you still have the hand. So the finger is, has a unique place and it's a unique function, and it can wake up and realize the totality, but it's, it's still, it's a finger. And yeah. it's, it's fingerness is, uh, it's not a problem, it's, it's a joy, actually. <laughs> yeah. I, I interviewed someone a few weeks ago when we were talking about the fact that, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, I, I am not the body. Uh, but then you go, she said, well, go stick that person with a pin, and they say, well, wait a minute, yeah, I'm that also. <laughs> there is this body here, and, I, and I, I'm concerned about not having it stuck with pins. Uh, yes. But I think it's, it, it seems to be a matter of what one's primary uh, aff affiliation is or identification. It's really about identification. Mm -hmm. And when you realize the true identity of yourself, it includes everything. It includes the body. It includes everything. So... Mm -hmm. The only one who could say, I am not the body, is a somebody <laughs> that's, that's separate. So the somebody that's separate is the only issue that keeps you from the realization of totality. Huh. And yet, doesn't it also serve as a vehicle to that realization? It's sort it of is like, the vehicle. Yeah. Yes. It, 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 Our it's, ego it's, is the vehicle. Right. So it's like, you know, people, the ego is not an enemy. The ego is the vehicle to liberation. Mm -hmm. It's only the ego that suffers. It's only the ego that begins the spiritual search. It's only this identification as in me that has to find the truth. It's so it's beautiful. It's all part of the integrity of the whole process. So you can't fight the ego. You can't kill the ego because only the killer would be left. Mm -hmm. And so it's not about um, making war with any part of yourself. It's not about separating from any part of yourself. I'm not the body. I'm not the ego. Only the ego would say that. And so what tends to happen in our culture is we tend to spiritualize ego. And we end up with a spiritual ego that has all these beliefs. I am one. I am not the body. I am consciousness. I am love. But it becomes a spiritualized ego preaching rather than the freshness of discovery of not knowing. 
Yeah. I also get the sense when I hear people talking that way that they're very much in their heads. They're kind of intellectualizing something that really should be lived on a more visceral level. Yes. It's, it's like you're standing outside a restaurant and saying, oh, the curry is so tasty, you know, but you're not actually <laughs> eating the curry. Yes. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, here's another little passage from your book, page 59. When the individuated, unique personality returns to its homogenous source, the individuated personality knows itself to be a prism that conscious love shines through. Yes. I love that. Oh, thank you. So then that's, again, now the the body-mind is not the issue. It's actually the expression. It becomes the unique. Only you have that particular point of view in the whole universe. And that's where conscious love shines through your body and uses your speech and speaks with your words. Mm. And that, that's the beauty. Yeah, I have a friend who's fond of saying that we're all sense organs of the infinite. Yes, you that's, know? Good. that's good. And each sense organ has a different function. You know? It does, and each sense organ is, is unique and expresses the same. But mm -hmm. it expresses that same freshly in, in its own particular language and form. Yeah. It's interesting to consider, though, that, you know, I mean, the nose smells by virtue of consciousness. The eyes yeah. see by virtue of consciousness. So there's kind of a fundamental substratum. Yes, that, that it, like well, like the hand and the fingers, you know, the palm is common to all the fingers, but each yes. finger has its individuality and its, its separate function. That's right. Hmm. I don't mean to be preaching here. I'm just kind of playing, <laughs> playing with ideas with you. <laughs> uh -huh. huh. um, I just listened to uh, an interview with a skeptic, uh, an atheist, um, yesterday or, or so, and um, he was kind of arguing about evolution and you, you refer to a bit to Darwin and to evolution in your book um, and you know this this idea of random mutation uh, devoid of any sort of intelligence and uh, the more I listened to it the more I thought you know I, I guess I don't agree with Darwinian evolution I must be a, an intelligent design person or something because I feel that evolution there's... Evolution is intelligent design yeah it's a false distinction it's crazy I mean, how more intelligent can there be than evolution? It's, it's the brilliance, it's the genius that's inherent in uh, life itself, that life itself is informed by consciousness, is an expression of consciousness, and so is evolution, the intelligent product of that. I mean, to call evolution something separate from intelligent design, is a, it's a false dichotomy. Mm. And it amazes me that an intelligent scientific person can fail to see that I mean can look at anything uh, you know that a, that a heart surgeon could be an atheist or an astronomer or anything boggles my mind because what they're, they're kind of looking at this awesome display of divine intelligence because they've been conditioned by what they've been taught that God is I'm an atheist as deeply as they are oh a big old guy in the sky with a beard yeah, yeah. exactly there's no God <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah it's a literary fiction mm-hmm Mostly what people consider God has been made up in literary fiction, and they read about it. So how would you define God? Well, you've already done it. I've done yeah. it, yeah. yeah. Just as a sort of all-pervading intelligence. Yes, all-pervading intelligence. The consciousness that is before the Big Bang and expresses itself in the Big Bang and mm -hmm. discovers itself through the products, byproducts of the Big Bang. Although I think some people deny that too, but... Uh, we don't have to dwell on that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just kind of seems so evident. Um, yeah. uh, okay, here's another point you made. The experience of awakening is, com is completely personal, different for each person. We've touched on this already, but you know, I th expound on that a bit, the, how their awakening could have different flavors according to the, the taster. Each one of us is unique. No one else occupies your moment in time and space. Mm -hmm. And so it's completely fresh and unknown. And when it gets expressed through you, the same ocean of consciousness expresses itself and experiences itself uniquely, freshly, in an unknown way. It speaks with a, an unspoken tongue. Hmm. Perhaps a, a takeaway point from that is don't get too hung up on comparing yourself with other people's descriptions of awakening or enlightenment, you know, because it may not show up in the same way for you. It definitely won't show up in the same way. And it's the egoic mind of comparison that keeps you separate from what it is you're searching for. Mm. So really, it's so simple to simply stop, to stop, to give up the search, to not look for something different, to not look for something new, to not look for something outside of yourself. 
and that stopping is really the secret to liberation hmm. to not go to the past to not touch the future and then people misidentify that by saying well I'm just being here now but who is where exactly <laughs> <laughs> and so that we, we consider see like when Ram Dass first writes um, uh, be here now it's just you know psychedelic hippies that get it and then when Eckhart Tolle does the power of now and it becomes on Oprah and it becomes mainstream it's beautiful now the people millions of people who never had an understanding have a deeper understanding but it immediately gets captured by the ego as trying to just be here now as if the body is what's here and you are the body and you're just showing up here now but the very process of these words reads going from this mouth to that ear to your ear it's already passed so there is no now in this present moment it's already passed these sensory experiences that we then take in and interpret as being here now are already gone mm. so we're continually living in the past we're living in the past as long as it takes the light wave to hit our retina let alone from the retina then make sense of it to then decide oh that means this and that means that of course that's not a heck of a lot of time it happens but it's still past yeah so, so to be here now is to be before past and future to be present before the body before the identity as a somebody who's being here now before perception before perception mm -hmm. that's right because then the perceiver is perceived without any subject object division then there's no time involved yeah, so in other words, be here now would not mean, all right, I'm paying attention to this food I'm putting in my mouth, now I'm paying attention to this TV show. I'm what it, it's more That's like right. dwell, dwelling and being irrespective of sensory experiences. That's it. It's, that's exactly right, prior to sensory experience. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned in your book that you awoke to your true nature but didn't know how to stop the egoic mind. So yeah. that, that implies that the egoic mind... Um, can coexist with awake, ha having, you know, being awake to one's true nature. I mean, it says that. And and my question is, doesn't the egoic mind tend to overshadow one's true nature? Isn't aren't they somewhat in competition, as it were? They are. They're in competition for the space and time. And so, um, the tendency is for most of us is that with psychedelics or with meditation or with love making, there's a, at least glimpses or profound moments or weeks or where we realize the truth mm -hmm. and in that realization the egoic re-identification happens and then we it's like okay I know who I am but then this continues to play out and so then there's a war with that but it's only the ego that fights with the ego so then how to come to peace how to come to silence is really the the issue and that happens when all the war is given up, when you stop trying to change or fix anything, when you're willing to be still. Silence is the key. Did you find in your own experience that you went through a phase where you seemed to, sort of the I got it, I lost it syndrome, where, where there was a sort of a, an awakening and then you felt gripped and lost again and then an awakening and that oscillated back and forth and then eventually something broke and there was never any possibility of, of losing it again, apparently. Well, you know, in my experience, that it didn't happen that way. I, mm -hmm. in my, in, I woke up when I, uh, in very unusual circumstances. And the LSD trip in the cabin. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and that never left. It's yeah. here now. I mean, mm -hmm. I, that realization was permanent. Mm -hmm. But along with that realization, I had no psychological insight into my nature, into my character, into ego. I did, I'd never studied any of it. I'd never been with a teacher. I'd never had learned any distinction. I just I knew who I was, I knew I was awake, and I was searching for a teacher. It took, it took me 18 years to find one, but along the way, if people contacted me, some would get it, but mostly what they would get would be my personality. Mostly they'd get would be you know my own stuff that was still there and hadn't been hadn't shed, hadn't been shed, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so the realization didn't change, but the expression of it is what deepens. The uh, When everything is shed, then there's a freshness of contact that's possible. Yeah.
some people do speak of having awoken or had a, had this realization and then kind of going through this on again off again phase before yeah. it stabilizes but maybe they're not talking about the same depth of realization that you're referring to maybe what you're referring to is something which once having realized couldn't be overshadowed that's for sure you know, when you when everything in the whole universe disappears, when there is no earth, there's no people, there's no time, there's no space, and you are completely present, awake, and clear in that, you know without a doubt who you are and where you are. You know you are consciousness. You know you are formless, timeless, spaceless. How can you ever? It's impossible to lose that. But that realization, while it can be ever present. You know, the egoic mind can then try to do something about it or try to teach someone or fix someone or do something with it because there hasn't been this distinction between the uh, clarity of consciousness and the imaginary doing of something. Yeah, and then, of course, you know, I mean, the trials and tribulations that life can throw at you can, can be challenging. Oh, I'm, I lost my job, now I'm, I'm, I'm going into foreclosure, and now my kid is on drugs, and, you know, all these problems can be, get so taxing. I mean, I know people who've been meditating 40, 40 years who sometimes get into depressed states or, you know, just kind of freaked out or had to have a stroke or something and and then you know so what was this all about you know i'm, I'm miserable <laughs> so yeah. yeah so that's a wake-up call if you're if that's what's happening you realize that everything before that has just been a spiritual trance mm -hmm. you know spiritual ego and so that's the opportunity is to um use the crisis to see deeper yeah so when you were in the thick of your of your cancer, which was an amazing story, uh, which, towards the end of your book you talk about it, and you know when you're on this heavy chemotherapy, which is this kind of experimental treatment to knock it out, um, was I mean you must have felt like crap, but was yes. you know was that sort of inner light still unperturbed by yes. that by all that stuff? You know I was ready to live and ready to die. Mm -hmm. And either way, I, whatever served best is what I wanted. If it served for my death, I'm happy for it. If it serves for my life, I'm happy for it. And it was, yeah, it was definitely not pleasant. It was definitely, I mean, painful. And yeah. You lost several pain. inches in height because yeah. your spine was collapsing. And That's right. <laughs> bones were broken. And, and, you know, the chemotherapy is nauseating and, you know, it's painful and the whole yeah. thing processes not pleasant but it doesn't touch the truth of yourself hmm. yeah it's interesting because you know some people push, put a fair amount of emphasis on the correlation between physiology and consciousness and the need for a physiology capable of uh, supporting that enlightened consciousness but you know it seems to me from all the records of you know Nisargadatta and Ramana dying of cancer and all kinds of other Christ being crucified and so on that, that there can one can cross a threshold after which doesn't matter what happens to the body. That that awakening maybe maybe it's sustained by some subtle aspect of the physiology that isn't touched by disease or, or injury, but somehow it's never lost at a certain point. That's right. That's what we're here for. It's for the realization that's never lost, regardless of what's happening physically, emotionally, or mentally. Mm. So that uh, yeah, I mean the cancer was a physical nightmare, and before that, you know, um, when my affair was turned into a scandal by a therapist. It was an emotional nightmare. I mean, the whole people who said they loved me suddenly hated me. The whole world turned on me. I mean, it was a witch hunt. I'd never experienced being the uh, being on that side of a witch hunt. It was whoa. Mm -hmm. So, it showed me so much. It showed me the capacity of emotions and the limbic brain, and I learned so much from it. But it, mm -hmm. it never touched the truth of myself. It never tr touched the truth of the realization. It just. If the truth of the realization gave me the capacity to just stand and take it, to uh, not fight back, not prove anything, but just take it, just yeah. take it, accept it, say, okay, I did it, I, I take full responsibility, here I am, I'm willing to be, uh, you know, the willing for truth and reconciliation with anybody at any time. Well, you know, both of those things sort of served as teaching examples for other people who perhaps, you know, who are willing to see them. Um, because, uh, you know, I mean, I, I kind of, uh, I didn't know you too well in the past. I've never met you in person even. But 
when I kind of read about how you went through those things and how you dealt with them and how you came out the other side, I, you know, gained a lot of respect because those, both of those things could happen to any of us. And if you, mm -hmm. and if somebody thinks that's not possible, then <laughs> they're setting themselves up for a fall. <laughs> Definitely. And you know, and I was setting myself up because I was so arrogant. I mean, I had become arrogant because I had been celibate for 12 years. I was finished with sexuality and I was, and I saw other teachers falling and I felt superior mm. on some level. And that subtle inflation of egoic inflation of feeling superior had to be popped. Yeah, interesting. And it got popped. <laughs> yeah. And as I say, it wasn't just for your benefit. It was for the benefit of anyone who wants to sort of observe, you know, and take lessons from what others experience and perhaps, you know, save themselves the same trauma by gaining a little humility, you know? Yeah, that would be nice. But, you yeah. know, I had just read... I had just finished reading the Richard Baker's book, Shoes Outside the Door, about his fall from being the Roshi of the Zen community of America to having uh, had an affair with his best friend's wife and the collapse and the destruction of that. And I just finished reading that book when I fell. And mm -hmm. so it didn't help in any way except it inflamed me some more. And then, oh, that idiot, how could he be so stupid to him? Yeah. Know? How could he be so dumb, man? What's the deal? Why, come on, you're awake. How could you do that? And as I put the book down, it happened to me. Wow. So, <laughs> huh. In a way, it kind of loops back to what we started talking about in the beginning of this interview, which is um, you know, further refinement after awakening. I mean, perhaps that take, can take the dimension of more ideal behavior over time. Um, although, of course, that has a lot of cultural connotations and, and boxes. I mean, there are, there are cultures in which polygamy is totally normal or whatever. But um, That's right. But what it is, here's what it is, Rick, is that mm -hmm. there's this subtle inflations of ego that can happen in the midst of realization where mm -hmm. you can start to feel special in any way. You start to feel superior in any way. And when that comes, it has to be popped. And then mm -hmm. there's a some sort of, uh, depending on how inflated it is, there's that, that size of an explosion when it gets popped. Interesting, yeah. F it's my observation that sometimes, you know, egregious inflations of ego take place as a result of some awakening. It's, just, it's almost as if there's this tenacious bit of ego that just goes haywire once there's that fuel of consciousness illuminating it and people begin proclaiming themselves to be avatars and exactly. you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. I mean, the guy was really nuts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> egomaniac. I mean, really an egomaniac. Yeah. I mean, you know, let's speak the truth about it. I mean, I guess we know who we're referring to in this right. case. The Avatar. Right. But there have been other exam There have been numerous examples. I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is not, to my mind, to say that there couldn't be avatars. But you know, most of the people who claim it um, probably aren't. <laughs> you know, one of the things my teacher said, which I really enjoy, he said, you know. Be careful about people who give themselves spiritual names. Mm. That uh, either you're named by your students or you're named by your teacher. Uh -huh. When you start giving yourself inflated spiritual names, that's really a danger signal. Mm. Interesting. So obviously, Gangaji got hers from Papaji and accepted yes. it, and could yes. have kept calling herself Tony, but you know, went with Gangaji. I actually got a spiritual name from Ama, the hugging saint, but I just felt like I can't run around calling myself that. <laughs> you know, I just assumed stay with Rick. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, my teacher said to me, he said, you know, if you shave your head and call yourself Swami, mm -hmm. you'll have a much bigger following. Mm -hmm. But then people will think you're different in some way. They'll think you're separate. They'll think, oh, he's a Swami. He doesn't have to go through what we go through. So, yeah, and I suppose if you're really sincere about this game, then uh, you, you're. Why would you want to create obstacles for yourself by, by doing kind of you know by setting yourself up in that way for all kinds of pitfalls? I mean, you know, keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple. <laughs> keep it simple. Keep it silent. Silent yeah. is the simplest. Hmm. Quiet is the simplest. Yeah. Not touching the next thought. <clears throat> Let's talk about practices for a bit. Um, you mentioned in your book that you engaged in a lot of practices, and you say you still practice some of them. Um, and in the book you say, awakening happens suddenly after lifetimes of gradual ripening. And of course the title of the book is Sudden Awakening. Um, but what if a person isn't sufficiently ripe for sudden awakening? Um, wouldn't 
practices perhaps be helpful for many people to kind of bring them to the ripeness that you know is going to make sudden awakening feasible possible sure everything's useful in its own way everything's useful in its own context mm -hmm. it's just um, practice may help you mature in some way may help you refine yourself or uh, control your mind in different ways ultimately it won't lead to realization but it can be useful along the way Hmm. Perhaps uh, there's some Zen guy that said, uh, you know, awakening may be an accident, but spiritual practice can make you accident prone. So per perhaps it can sort of ready you for the, you know, make you more... Possibly. Yeah. But, you know, if you look at all the ashrams in India with millions of people doing yoga their whole lives and never yeah. never waking up. Right. So the problem with a pra any practice is that it reinforces the idea of a practitioner. And the practitioner is someone, is the egoic identity, trying to get something from the practice. And that's the trap. So yes, they can be useful. I mean, I, I love my Taoist practice. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I loved Zazen when I sat in Zen temples. But um, Did those reinforce uh, the sure. notion of an, a practicer? Sure. Hmm. How about the old notion that it takes a thorn to remove a thorn? I mean, can't there be practices which actually dissolve and diminish the notion of... And, and maybe it depends on the practice. I mean, some practices might sort of be, you know... Any, any practice, there's someone practicing. Mm -hmm. And the someone practicing is the only obstacle to what you want. It's always a search into the future. Whatever you're practicing is so that you'll be better or different next time. What if the nature of the practice is that during it, the practicer dissolves into sort of no, no someoneness? Then yeah. why just call it a practice? Why not just live it? Stop practicing and start living, I'd say. <laughs> if that's your practice, if your practice is dissolve into nothing, then be nothing. Why <clears> practice? <throat> because the practice assumes that that's only going to last for a certain period of time, and then you're going to pick up the practice of me. So... Just stop the practice of me and everything else will take care of itself. How do you stop the practice of me? Hmm. As you said, by fully stopping. By you dissolving. You said that. <laughs> no, you said, but oh. you said you can have a practice where you fully dissolve and yeah. everything disappears or whatever you said about it. Actually, yeah. I'm alluding to my own experience here, and, and I might as well pursue this a little bit, because a, a friend of mine is always bugging me about this and saying, ask Eli about that, because you know, you, <laughs> you've been doing this for 44 years. But you know, when I was 18, I learned Transcendental Meditation, and my experience of it was that you know, I'd, I'd sit for 20 minutes, and I'd just uh, dissolve into you know, ocean of bliss, ocean of being, or whatever, and then I'd come out again, of course, and then I'd undissolve. Uh, but over time, I kind of b began to find that the analogy of dyeing a cloth and bleaching it in the sun and dyeing it and bleaching it and dye until it becomes color fast even when it's in the sun bore, you know, began to play out in my life. So there was an example of a practice which sort of didn't, at least in my experience, didn't seem to reinforce but actually began to dismantle and dissolve the rigidity of my ego and individuality. Um, yes, everything's useful. Yeah. Everything is useful. But then, at a certain point, you have to say, okay, enough. I don't want to come back out of it anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't want to end the 20 minutes and come back to me, the practice of me. Because me is a practice. You have to practice me. And so, finally, yes, you have a maturity that comes from those years of your deepening through your practice to say, okay, I have to stop the practice of me. And then you don't have to re rematerialize. That well, way. that's what I actually what I've found over time is that I don't come out of it anymore, and it, but I still do it. And why do I do it? Because it's tremendously restful for the body. It seems sure. to have this refining influence and so on. But whether or not I'm doing it, there's that sort of continuum. Sure, I know. love sitting. I love meditating. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And yet I have friends who say, I don't bother meditating anymore because it really makes no difference whatsoever. So. You know, maybe that'll be my experience next year, but you know, right now it's this. <laughs> it's you like, know, listen, you, you know, all you have is your attention, and then the question is, you know, how are you going to spend it? Yeah. And why not spend it meditating instead of spending it hanging out in the bar? You know? Yeah. Or watching TV or something. Or watching TV or having a beer, whatever it is. It's like, you know, give yourself the best quality. Why not? You know. Mm -hmm. Um. 
Okay, that, I, I like you, uh, you. I think you covered that well. I appreciate it. Um, one thing that's often said, and you use the analogy, and I, maybe, I guess you're quoting Papaji, about you know, the intensity of the desire for freedom being important. And I, I think he used the analogy, if your hair is on fire, you're running to the river, and you're not going to sit down with some friends and have a card game or something like that. That's right. But, but you know, by the same token, if your hair were on fire, you wouldn't eat or go to the bathroom or watch a movie or do anything else. Um, you'd be running to the river. And yet, you know, in normal life, we do these things. So, um, and I've seen people who get so extreme that they were, you know, fasting and to extremes and, and just kind of like pushing themselves. And I've actually had a friend or two who went mentally ill because of that strain of, of extreme, extremism. So where do you find the balance, you know, between the firing up the desire for enlightenment and being kind of a, a, a bit of a normal, natural, relaxed person? Well, you know, if you look at the Buddha's experience... And when he went out, he was on fire for waking up. He saw mm. the suffering of the world. Mm. And he tried extreme. Yeah. He, went, he tried fasting. He tried extreme fasting. He tried extreme yogas. He did lots of extreme stuff. And finally he said, okay, I'm just sitting here until I get it, no matter what. And he sat down under the tree until he got it. Day and night, I'm sitting here until I get it. That's the steadfastness. That's the willingness. That's the desire that is unshakable. And then... Forget about ordinary life. Ordinary life takes care of itself. Mm. If it comes back, it comes back. If it doesn't, it doesn't. That's not your business. You've given yourself fully to what you, to the truth of yourself. And then how that expresses itself is unknown. Maybe you stay as a naked sadhu in a cave somewhere. Maybe you live the normal householder life. But it's not about your doing it either way. Mm. It's really just uh, surrendering yourself so fully that it expresses itself naturally through you. Hmm. I once heard of a saint who lit an instant, incense stick and said, if I'm not enlightened by the time this incense stick burns down, I'm going to kill myself. And he got enlightened before it burned down. But, <laughs> but um, I mean, even, that obviously would be an extreme example. And even, you know, any the average person listening to this, would it would be extreme for them to go sit under a tree and say, I'm going to sit here until I get enlightened. But... The Buddha, obviously, after his enlightenment, came out with the middle way, didn't he call it? It was sort of a balanced path with the right livelihood and this and that and the other thing. That It was sort of a kind of a, a antidote to extre extremism. You know, his uh, Eightfold Path, my teacher said, is, comes as an expression of realization, not as a path to realization. Mm. So you can practice right thinking, right action, right livelihood, right yada yada, and you never wake up. Mm -hmm. But if you wake up, then those things will naturally express themselves through you. Does it work both ways? I mean, if you pull a table leg, all the other legs come along. If if you uh, you know wake up, all those things are going to be expressing naturally. But also, if you kind of bring your life more into alignment with things like that, can that be conducive to enlightenment? Can it work both ways? Well, you know, it possibly. Everything's possible. Anything's useful. And yet, if you look at the um, all the monks and nuns that have cloistered themselves in order to search for God, very few of them actually find it. Yeah. It's true. Perhaps because they're kind of out of their dharma in, in a way, you know, just living a life which, you know, I'm sure there's a legitimate reason for monks and nuns and some who are cut out for it, but look at the Catholic Church. I mean, a lot of people who are exactly. <laughs> trying to live it aren't apparently cut out for it. And, you know, and the, the Buddha ends up setting up monasteries and doing all this stuff for his people because that's what they want. Mm -hmm. It wasn't his teaching. It wasn't really what he was speaking. But then, okay, you want to do it, do it. You know? hmm. <laughs> and it helps to have a structure. I mean, you have the Leela Foundation, yeah. and it has, you know, a, a certain tax status and certain, you know, you have an accountant, uh -huh. and you have to do all that relative stuff to, to, to provide a vehicle to make it available. Yes. But, you know, that kind of happens on its own. It's like you don't have to really force it. You don't have to work at it, or at least I didn't. You know? mm. yeah. and, and when I went out searching, it wasn't about foundations or anything, you know. I mean, I just gave myself over fully. In being in that cabin in Colorado, it was like I was willing to die, if that's what it took. I didn't want to die. I was afraid of dying, and I fought it. But I was willing, if that's what it took. And then that woke up. And then after I woke up, I left that... I, left, I had already, as a federal fugitive, I'd left everything behind. I mean, I'd left my career, I'd left my family, I'd left 
all the normal pursuits that people think give you a happy life. And then when I went searching for my teacher, I went off into Peru where I lived for six months. But I left. I had fifty dollars in my pocket when I left, and uh, I never looked back. And so from there, it's like the life unfolded in such a mysterious, full way. I mean, I've had life experiences I never could have imagined or wanted, and unbelievable. And it's not because I worked for them or I did them or because they had to be there in order to support. It was just life unfolding itself quite naturally, mm. quite mysteriously. Seek and ye shall find, knock and the door shall be opened. It's, you, you see that, you know, when a person kind of makes the decision to move in that direction, circumstances start working out in ways they it does. The couldn't have anticipated. Universe, yeah. The whole universe is in support of awakening. Yeah. And so you give yourself to awakening and the whole universe supports it. Not in giving us, you know, little happy smile rainbows, you know. It can be total tragedy and mm -hmm. here is a tragedy, you know. It can be whatever it takes, whatever it takes, the universe will provide it. And if what it takes is death, then the universe will provide death. If what it takes is life, then it provides life. So you can trust love. You can trust consciousness to such a degree that you don't have to worry about setting up a foundation or having an accountant or... <laughs> any of that stuff, you know, that takes care of itself. Mm. Those are byproducts. That's not something to be pursued. Interesting. You know, hearkening back again to the beginning of the interview, we, we talked about how often, usually this is looked at from the perspective of the individual. Okay, I can trust this, and I should, you know, light, intensify my my desire, and then the universe will help me, and so on and so on. But flipping it around again, you know, we are that universal intelligence which has cultured this particular expression to the point where it's able to begin to recognize itself. Yes. And, you know, there's that bumper sticker, let go and let God. Perhaps, you know, since we, you know, most people do still have a sense of individuality, um, all, all you really have to do is be cooperative. You know, when those stirrings start to happen and, you know, enjoy the I ride. I saw another bumper sticker uh, when I was in Austin that said, uh, if you love something, set it free. Mm. And if it doesn't come back, hunt it down and kill it. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> that seems a little cynical or something. <laughs> um, you know, it's like... I never wanted a relationship. I never wanted children. And so I, I made a vow when I was 10 years old not to have kids. And so mm -hmm. I was free of that. Mm -hmm. So I never had to get entangled in career and family and all of that. And I never wanted to settle down. And so when the universe presented me with the goddess in a human form, I wasn't interested. I wasn't interested in long term. I loved sex, of course, and fun, of course, but commitment and settling down, what for? And now it's like this. that was 1970 when I first met my partner and we've been together ever since so mm -hmm. um, 30 something years 40, 40 years whatever it is it's not something that I ever searched for or ever wanted but it was one of the gifts that was uh, bestowed by the goddess of love and I'm so lucky and grateful I met mine that year too and for 11 years I said absolutely not I want to be a monk <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then finally, eleven years later, uh -huh. my life was kind of like falling apart, and it was like, I, you know, it had to happen, and it and it happened, and it was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thirteen years for me <laughs> before we got married. Yeah, we lived together for thirteen years. My wife is hearing me saying falling apart. No, I say it was falling apart before we got married, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, I was just so so ex pushing myself to such extremes. I had, like, big boil on my neck, and I it was eccentric and obsessive and all this stuff, and I, I needed balancing in, this, in, the, in the worst way. Yes. I know, that's what I was saying. She said, you were the one falling apart. All right, we've resolved that. <laughs> um, you uh, you have a, a bit in your book about wounding as a spur to seeking, and we've sort of been addressing that, um, but uh, maybe we can dwell on it just a little bit more. Um, you know, when when bad things happen to good people, so on and so forth, there there seems to be a kind of a, a loving hand at work, even when bad things happen. You know, the ego has to be wounded. The egoic shell has to be pierced, and in that piercing, it can be very painful. And in the very pain of the wounding can be the start of the spiritual search, the start for relief, the start for the end of suffering. But it's really, it's like a, a chick hatching out of a, an egg. 
like there's a pecking from the outside and then the chick has to peck it from the inside. And so the pecking from the outside is experienced as a wounding because suddenly your impervious shield has been pierced mm -hmm. and uh, there's pain, there's suffering. It's like the, the Buddha waking up and seeing old age, sickness and death were all kind of woundings that happened into his shell of egoic uh, identity. And so each one of us has those woundings. We have this time where things pierce, where we are shattered, we are broken. And that's really the... Before that happens, really, there's usually no spiritual search. There's no need for it because you're already content and full-on in your egoic identity. And so the, the, the cracking of the shell from the outside is the first step. And then you, as the chick on the inside, have to peck it have to peck at the shell to, to, to burst free from it in some way. Hmm. There's a saying that angels aren't interested in enlightenment because their experience is too glorious, you know. And it's as a human being, we have a much greater kind of a opportunity because, you know, the human life is a school of hard knocks and, and we're not going to just be content with it. There's, you know, we're going to be goaded until we seek something deeper. Yes, yeah. <laughs> My teacher said the same thing. He said, the, in the realm of the gods, there's all too much noise. They're all talking and boasting and <laughs> doing all their things. And so when a human comes to silence, all the gods come to sit at your feet to mm. receive the transmission of silence because that doesn't happen in heaven. Mm. There's a, a beautiful phrase uh, in the Hindu puja, which is, uh, at whose door the whole galaxy of gods pray for perfec perfection day and night. And it's, it, with reference to the guru. Yes. Yeah, um, I'm going to interview a guy in a few weeks named David Gersten who wrote a book called Are You Getting Enlightened or Losing Your Mind and uh, I think you, you referred to your book in, uh, in your book to madness or fear of madness and um, I've, I've seen you know there, there seems to be a sort of a you know a cohesiveness to the rigid egoic personality which sometimes in the process of transferring transforming to a liberated state um, can be a tricky business because that cohesiveness on the one hand keeps us bound but on the other hand it keeps us sane and uh, there can be a kind of, I've seen people flip out going to mental hospitals and, and whatnot in the who are doing our you know devoted spiritual practice or, or on that but what path. I, I say that what you're calling sane I would call a kind of controlled madness Mm, bottled up madness yeah people are crazy egos are crazy it's like mm. we're living in a crazy world we're living on a slave planet and everyone is you know somewhat insane mm. and just the ego that gives you a structure to appear sane in an insane world so yes there is that tendency you know I mean I, I remember this one woman who had a brain tumor and because of her brain tumor she uh, lost her sense of eye mm. and Suzanne Siegel Suzanne Siegel. Yeah, yeah. So Suzanne was a was a suffering person, mm -hmm. filled with fears, anxieties, <clears throat> and her, this loss of sense of eye. The community embraced her as a spiritual teacher, as so if she had something to impart. But she didn't. She had a brain tumor, and she ended up dying, suffering and afraid. So madness is very different from the from silence. Hmm. So silence is is sanity. So if you just stop following this train of thought, it may seem like a train wreck, but you end up in silence. And silence has clarity, wisdom, intelligence, sanity. That's what true sanity is. All, our, all the talking to ourselves is just a kind of madness. Hmm. My wife just wrote me a note saying, selfless service keeps you grounded and is a path in and of itself. Seva. <laughs> Yeah, the, the selfless service is so beautiful. The problem is there's usually someone trying to do it, and the one who's trying to do it is the only obstacle to it. Mm. And so when you stop trying to do selfless service, your life itself becomes an expression of selfless service. Yeah, that's another one of those cart and horse conundrums. Um, and because uh, I could, you know, ar argue the flip side and say, well, if a person is all just about me, 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 how can I gratify myself? That that kind of tends to continue to reinforce the ego. Whereas, it does. you know, whereas there, when there really is a selfless service, even if a person is somewhat egotistical to begin with, it can kind of have the the effect of diminishing that egotism and and you know, putting one in a larger 
context or perspective than just all, all about me. You know, I just saw Bill Clinton, an interview with Bill Clinton, where he said, you know, selfishness is the same as selflessness, because really what I'm doing for the world, I'm doing for myself. And, mm -hmm. you know, you could say he's doing that kind of selfless service, but it's not diminishing his ego in any way. It's not uh, making him any more transparent as, a, as pure consciousness. So, yeah, it's better to be selfless than selfish. Better in your practice to practice selflessly than practice selfishly. But... It's not even about a search for enlightenment. That's selfish also. It's really a search for truth. Mm. If you search for truth, forget enlightenment. It doesn't matter. Oh, aren't they synonymous? No. A search for truth, it doesn't matter if you're enlightened or not. A search for enlightenment doesn't, isn't necessarily looking for the truth. It's looking for me to wake up. So, yeah, but when you actually do, isn't that truth? And then, and then you realize it's not the me who woke up. I mean, it's, we're almost this is almost a semantical. No, I'm talking about the search. Argument. Okay, no, I'm talking about the search. So if you're searching for the truth, the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. If you're searching for enlightenment, generally you're searching for an experience that isn't here in this moment, and you're going off somewhere else. You're practicing something, or you're working on something, or you're trying to get somewhere, and so. What I'm speaking about is what's already here that needs no practice and needs no search, and that the practice and the search actually obscure the presence of what's already here. Mm -hmm. And when you're willing to find the truth of what's here, that truth itself sets you free, and then your being itself is selfless service. It is an expression of consciousness, mm -hmm. not because you want it to be or it should be, but just because that's who you are already. Yeah, we spoke earlier of being sense organs of the infinite. Uh, in, a, in a way, we, we become organs of actions of the infinite. That's you right. Know? Yeah. Your and life is an expression of consciousness. Serving in whatever way the infinite moves us to serve. Exactly. And it's a mystery. It's a complete mystery. Mm -hmm. I never expected to write a book. and I've written a bunch of books. I never expected to travel. I didn't like traveling. I, I mean, when my, my parents took the family to Europe, I didn't go. I wasn't interested in traveling. I like being here in the United States. And I've been on the road now for nine months a year for years. I've, been, I've traveled all over the world in places I've never expected to go, never wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And yet, what a mystery it is. It's yeah. really beyond belief. Hmm. Um, looping back again to another point we brought up in the beginning, um, here's a question for you. When seeking ends, do exploration and discovery and deepening end? And before you answer the question, I want to quote a couple of people. Adyashanti said, even now with me, the mystery is just beginning, always still beginning. And um, St. Teresa of Avila said, the feeling remains that God is on the journey too. That's it. <laughs> you can respond. <laughs> you know, you said several words there that were not necessarily compatible. So okay. you, don't, you don't need to be seeking mm -hmm. for the freshness to be here. That the seeking actually overlooks the freshness that's here. Oh yeah, but you know. So, but my question was, when seeking ends. So, in oh, other words, okay. you know, when seeking has really, when you when no longer ends. have that seeking energy anymore, yes. does that necessarily mean uh, that there's going to be an end to exploration and discovery and refinement okay, and okay, deepening? So it, that's what it is. Yeah, e exploration is very different from discovery. Uh huh. So you don't have to explore. I see. You can realize freshly, mm -hmm. deeply, in, and that happens quite naturally. You know, I mean, it's like you don't have to be an explorer. You just have to be still. So exploration has the connotation of I'm still looking for something, whereas discovery, yes. discovery has the connotation of <clears throat> just kind of finding things. That's it. As they present themselves. That's what it is. That's mm -hmm. the difference. Yeah, it's a subtle distinction. I mean, we say Columbus discovered America. He was actually looking for, well, he was looking for India, actually. <laughs> actually, he was looking for China. He was looking for Cathay. Oh, was he? <laughs> and he thought he was just south of China, and that's why he was in India. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, do, uh, it seems that, you know, like Ramana and Papaji had a, either a belief or an experience in what we would call supernatural beings, such as Shiva, for instance. The mountain was the embodiment of Shiva, and a few minutes ago you referred to, to Papa, Papaji, referred to the realm of the gods, and so on. So they kind of acknowledged the existence of these strata of creation, 
yes. which maybe we could even just think of as laws of nature in a, in a subtle sense. Um, do you feel that there's, uh, what, maybe we could discuss that a little bit. I mean, Ramana was devoted not just to the mountain as a mass of stone, but to its, to its function as the embodiment of Shiva, I suppose. Yes, yes. Um, so how does, you know, after, and he was, you know, well ripened in his realization, obviously. So what is the significance or relevance of devotion to some higher being or higher power or whatever post-realization? You know, devotion is an act of love. Mm -hmm. So we stay with what we love. And whatever it is, if it's your holy mountain, if it's your, it's always an embodiment of uh, love. So love loves love. So if Ramana, it's Shiva as a holy mountain, that's what he loves. It's not, a devotion is a practice. It's not devotion is something it's that you... A spontaneous expression. Yes, it's just a spontaneous expression of love. Mm -hmm. You know, and then that, that's quite, why not, you know? And all, everything's present. I mean, there's so many, how many dimensions are there and how many beings in every dimension? Mm -hmm. It's infinite. We, we can't know the number of beings and, and we have, don't have, the, and I don't know, string theory says what, 13 dimensions mm -hmm. uh, wrapped inside each other. So, if there are 13 dimensions of being wrapped inside each other, it's, it's an infinite possibility of freshness and realization. But you don't you don't have to search for it. No, I wasn't implying so, that necessarily. Just or the, explore for it. You don't have to explore. Right, but it may be something that blossoms at a certain sure, stage. Sure, Yeah. You know, when I first met my teacher, he took. Uh, when I first met Papaji, it, it was in Hardwar, and I told him he he wanted me to do satsang, and I said, no, actually, my wife is the sakuru. You have to meet my wife, and uh, I'd like he said, well, he said, two of you, great. He said, and I said, but my wife is not a yogi. She's a goddess, and I have to find the best place for her to stay. Mm -hmm. And so we took a train together to uh, Hardwar, because he's going to meet her at the banks of the Ganga. And when we got there, it was Shiva Yatri. It was this Shiva festival. And so there was loudspeaker Shiva chanting 24 hours a day mm -hmm. for the first few days that we were there. And then uh, when I was sitting at the bank of the Ganga one night, and suddenly the music went off, the chanting went off, and it became completely still. And I was sitting at the bank of the Ganga meditating, and I could hear the chanting in my head. And when I listened to it and put my attention there, it disappeared. And I heard it on a deeper level. I heard it more subtly, still mm. chanting in my being. And when I put my attention there, it disappeared. That happened on a third level, mm. very subtle level where this chanting was still happening. I put my attention there, it disappeared. And then mm. as I fell into this blissful emptiness it's like this suddenly a, a gust of wind came up along the Ganga as it came down towards me and as it touched me I became frozen and I, I became shivering I got into like a fetal position and it felt like Shiva has, was coming down the river and as the hem of Shiva's cloak touched my being it's like suddenly I was plugged into 220 instead of 110 I was like my whole body became electrified. My hair stood on end. I was shivering and shaking beyond belief, not at meeting Shiva, but at having the hem of his cloak touch me as it passed. Mm. And that was a supernatural event. That was a, a meeting of Shiva that uh, I've loved Shiva from my first awakening. Shiva has been part of my consciousness. So, mm. but I don't, but I don't worship Shiva. You know? Right. And uh, my heart is with my Sakuru, with Papaji. Papaji mm. is an embodiment of Shiva. It's like Raman is an embodiment of Shiva. Hmm. Shankara said the intellect imagines duality for the sake of devotion. Uh -huh. So you, you almost have to yes. imagine it to create some kind of dichotomy. Otherwise, it's all, it's yes. all one. <laughs> that's, that's what the universe is. The universe is the cloak of imagination. Mm. So the consciousness can love itself, find itself, be devoted to itself. What do you feel uh, is the importance of a teacher? You know, these days some people brush it off, ah, oh, gurus, you know. And, um, you know, there's that old saying, the teacher appears when the student is ready. Ob obviously, a teacher has been very important in your life. Um, do you feel like uh, there are exceptions to that rule? Or ultimately, does everyone kind of really need to have a, a final teacher to 
seal, the, de- a, seal the deal. You have to have a final teacher that's beyond your ego. Mm-hmm. Now, how that teacher appears, who knows? I personally, I was one of those who said, you don't need a teacher, do it yourself. I was part of the do it yourself movement. And uh, I needed a teacher. I didn't know that I needed a teacher. I knew I needed somebody more awake than I was to pass on mm. what I didn't have. And so that's what I was searching for. I wasn't searching for a, a teacher in the sense of a guru. I didn't want a guru. I was just searching for someone more awake than I was that could transmit to me how to pass on the realization I had realized. And so, that's a guru. That's a guru. <laughs> and I didn't. And so the last place I looked was India because I wasn't interested in gurus. I wasn't interested in being a devotee. I didn't. Was, I didn't like the whole guru scene. Right. And so I looked everywhere. When I started my spiritual search. I went to Peru. I went to the back Andes where I was the first gringo they'd ever seen. I was looking for a secret hidden brotherhood somewhere. I mean, did you do ayahuasca? I did ayahuasca. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Back in those days. Yeah. Yeah. Back, and then with the cancer, I got brought to a ayahuasca ceremony. Hmm. But uh, interesting. Now there's a question. This cancer, you know, this is post awakening. You know, you self realized, and yet you you did ayahuasca. So what was the experience of doing ayahuasca in, a, in a, an awakened state? You know, I wasn't looking for it. I was actually looking for my acupuncturist, mm-hmm. and uh, I went searching for him. And I'd heard there was this Brazilian shaman in town with him, and so. I went up to his place and I got there. Everybody was dressed in white and they were clearly all very stoned. And, you know, I got invited in. They, mm. they gave me clothes, they put me in white, and uh, they gave me a bunch of ayahuasca to drink. And they all prayed for me for my cancer, you know. Mm-hmm. So it was a very psychedelic experience, but, it, you know, it was phenomenal. Was yeah. So, in other words, in the midst of that psychedelic experience, there was that silence, which yes, there was a certainty. Yeah, I yeah. touched by it, and, and I was grateful. I mean, I, I'm so grateful that they put all their energy into praying for me. You know, it was beautiful. Mm. And this, I what it amazed me about the way they're using this ayahuasca these days is that after it was over, I was able to drive home that night. I mm-hmm. was totally sober. That was mind blowing to me. Ayahuasca in Peru was very different. I mean, we were tripping for three days. Mm. You couldn't drive home that night. <laughs> you know, I went blind actually from it after. Wow! Few days. So uh, it was very different. I mean, there was you know beings appeared in the room and you know yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, different yeah. experience. So yeah, why not? I mean, ayahuasca. What's the problem? I'm LSD. Why not? It's like there's no rules. There's no rules. It's like you drink coffee or you drink tea. You eat chocolate or you don't. You. Avoid sugar or you like sugar. What difference does it make? You know? Yeah, it's just that, you know, what, what you put in your body does have an effect on it and uh, on your brain and so on. And, you know, I got so sure. fried, fried on that stuff back in the 60s that I, you know, I have a, a bit of an aversion, but I'm open minded to the whole thing. You know, just very, I'm cautious. Safety first, you know. Uh, uh, well, I say throw caution to the winds, man. Sounds like you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had some guy get in touch with me and offer me to buy me a plane ticket to Peru because he was going down there. But <laughs> um, uh, I'd say LSD is the way, not more than ayahuasca for mm. if, for awakening, because mm. it has a, there's an icy clarity to LSD. Mm. You don't get the the dreamy like stuff with high, that you do with ayahuasca. Mm. What do you feel are the the planetary implications of individual enlightenment? I know that since your young young days, you've been a kind of a you know, political guy in, in wanting to change the world in, in various ways. And um, I, I suspect that, that the flavor of that remains, you know, despite your primary orientation just being awakening. But do you feel like there are sort of uh, there, there are going to be uh, effects of uh, awakening as it becomes more common on the world? That's been the purpose of my life since I woke up, was to bring the world to peace, that we all live as brothers and sisters in peace. Mm-hmm. And I knew that if everyone had the realization I had, the world would come to peace. And so that became my mission. Whether that will actually ever happen, I, you know, probably not in my lifetime. And you never know. It's like these floods of awakening can happen and get wiped out in an instant. Or mm-hmm. it could take over and the whole world could wake up. Really, there's no way of knowing. Well, you can yeah. do give yourself to it. No one really predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall. You know, they took everyone by surprise. So sometimes societal changes. And look where we are, like, with um, civil rights today as compared to the 60s. You know, there's 
been a lot. I mean, that new movie about Jackie Robinson is just coming out. You know, for and look what he had to go through. Now most of the, you know, star athletes are black. So right. changes so the, happen. Changes happen, and you know the tragedy of that because I was, as you know, involved fully in the civil rights movement, and I gave my life to it. It was my first step towards freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, I just saw something now where. I forget the movie where the woman says, you know, now there's no more black and white, it's all green. Hmm. And that's... Environmental? Meaning money. No, meaning money. Money, money, oh, of course. Money, it's all money. Huh. And so, you know, that's it. It's like, now everybody has their civil rights, but are they more free? Are they, I mean, better? Definitely. Definitely, we don't want apartheid. Definitely. But this, ultimately, ultimately, it didn't bring more freedom. It didn't bring more love. It didn't bring more peace. And in fact, I found probably more love and more humanity when I was in the segregated ghetto, surrounded by uh, the Ku Klux Klan, than I, than you find in a prosperous green community where everybody's going for the money. Hmm. So, you know, it's it's all a mystery how it unfolds. Yeah, but at the point we're sort of touching upon, though, is that there does seem to be a kind of a, a bit of an epidemic of, of spiritual awakening taking place. And, yes, there is. And, and technologies such as this are <clears throat> helping it to... It's mind-blowing. Yeah, mind -blowing. And, and it's got to have some kind of impact. I mean... It has know. had an impact. You know? Yeah, already, yeah. Sure. I mean, satsang all over the world. People mm -hmm. waking up all over the world. It's really... It's the first time. And it has to pass from heart to heart. Mm -hmm. Each person catches fire and passes on the flame. Mm -hmm. And in that, then, you know, it will spread exponentially. I mean, the <clears throat> weatherman used to have a slogan uh, about a prairie fire. It takes a single spark to start a prairie fire. Mm -hmm. And that's really what this is. It's the spark has been lit. Mm -hmm. It's alive in so many hearts, and it's passing from heart to heart. And so already the world has changed. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's now, there's, you know, yoga on every corner and people meditating and mm -hmm. the Internet having every teaching possible. People are waking up. And that's so beautiful. That's what we're here to support. So what do you feel your track record has been? You've been teaching for, I don't know, 20 years or something. Um, do you find that a lot of your students, certain healthy percentage, have woken up in the sense that you define it? Are you satisfied with the results? You know, satisfied with the results? I'd say I'm blown away that people have woken up. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's people have woken up. People, ordinary people, people you never would have expected, the least likely people have woken up and have stayed awake over a period of time and are now teaching and passing it on. That's mind-blowing to me. And never the ones that I expect it to be. Hmm. I mean, this, you know, I mean, people from very straight, Republican, ordinary lives that have woken, not had practice, not had psychedelics, not had <clears throat> yoga or teachers, wake up and stay awake and stay true to the realization. Did they stay Republican? No. <laughs> Atta boy. I, I have a few so friends. The world changing right there. Yeah. I have a few friends who are, you know, have been on a spirit, spiritual journey for decades, and they're still very conservative politically. It, it boggles my mind. I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> but, you know, variety is the spice of life, I guess. It's a mystery. It's all really a mystery. <laughs> Great. Well, that's all the questions I had written down. Um, you know, I kind of been thinking about this for a while, and I wanted to draw some new points out of you that we hadn't discussed in the previous interview. Um, is there anything? How you, how's your health? Is the cancer still in remission? It's you know, it's not called remission, but yeah, the cancer is manageable. And Good. I've stopped doing my chemotherapy after five years of chemotherapy. Oh, yeah. great! You don't have to do it anymore. Well, we'll or see. You, you know, it's all yeah. nobody knows. It's like mm -hmm. the radical intervention by these doctors worked so that now it used to be everybody would be dead by now yeah so I'm still alive so who knows how it will play out that's great but yeah I'm happy I'm healthy and I really appreciate you for being part of this global awakening that's happening and for helping to uh, you know spread the message around so that everybody can wake up everybody. thanks I'm doing what I feel is something I can do to you know make a contribution um you know, it's kind of like various skills that I've developed over the course of my life have just all come together to enable me to do this. You know, computer skills and spiritual things and speaking, public speaking experience and all that stuff. It just feels yeah. like the next logical 
thing to do. It's beautiful. That's how we all get used in our own particular way. Mm. And we each have our own particular strengths of mind and character and purpose, and we all get used in this universal play of consciousness awakening to itself. Yeah. Great. Well, keep at it. I hope you stay healthy and happy <laughs> well into your 80s, and uh, <laughs> if not 90s. And, and, and I expected to die before I was 30, you know? Yeah. And so it's all a mystery to me. I mean, I never, oh, I'm an old man, whoever would have guessed, you know? Yeah. I mean, I lived my life, as many of us did in the 60s, I said, hey, I'm not going to be 30. I'm never going to make it there. So Right. Never trust anyone over 30. That's it. So <laughs> give your life now fully. And so in that, here I am, an old man. What a mystery. What a surprise. So thank you for keeping the light alive and passing it on from heart to heart. Yeah, let me make a few concluding remarks. Um, I've been speaking with Eli Jackson Bear, and this is an ongoing series of interviews. So if this happens to be the first one you've seen, at this point there are about 170 others you can see at the time. Uh, you'll find them all at batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P.com. And uh, there also you will find a link to a podcast if you prefer, prefer to listen to this kind of stuff in audio rather than sit in front of your computer. Um, you will find a chat group that crops up around each interview uh, and gets quite lively at times as well as a sort of a general discussion group. Uh, there is also a donate button, which I appreciate people clicking if they have the inclination and ability. And there's a link to uh, signing up for a newsletter to be notified each time a new interview is posted, which is about once a week. Um, so that about does it. So Eli, thanks again. Give my love to Gangaji. I will. Um, Thank you, Rick. Yeah, I hope to meet you in person one of these days. That'd be nice. Yeah, and to those who have been listening or watching, we'll see you next week. May all beings be happy and free. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.